So in this video, I want to show you how to compare different forecasting algorithms. So let's code a little bit. I'm going to use the library forecast. Also the library FPP2. For, I'm going to use a couple of data sets there. And also grid extra to do some fancy plots. Okay. So I'm going to use a data set called HO2. If you take a look at the help, this is included in FPP2. This is the monthly corticosteroid drug subsidy in Australia. So not very interesting to me, but okay, I think it has some nice features that we can compare. The first thing that I'm gonna do, according to this kind of cheat sheet, is take a look at the data and try to see if we can apply some box Cox transformation or something like that. So let me do that. Okay, let's check box Cox lambda. Here we go. And this value is pretty close to zero, so I'm going to apply a logarithm. So I'm going to take, sorry, I'm going to define y as the logarithm of box. This is money, actually, I think. So logarithm base 10 log, sorry, HO2. Okay, so here we go. Now we have a data set. Okay, let's plot this data set. So we can have a, a good grasp of what's going on there. And you can see that we have a strong seasonality and a kind of train inside of there. So as I was saying in, in, in this cheat sheet again, let me show you that again. I'm going to start with STL, which STL actually is a kind of decomposition with asteroids. And there is some hidden features and actually it's using ETS to, to feed the, the seasonal part. But forget about the details. So I'm going to just use that to use a kind of decomposition. So I'm going to define feed STL. And I'm going to invoke the function STL, Y. And you have to define the type of window. If you take a look at the data, let's print this. You can see that we have uh, a time series data set and the frequency is 12 because we are starting with months. Okay, so I'm going to use pe pe periodic. Okay, so I'm going to take the period of the, f of the data itself. Okay, so here we go. Let's plot the fit. And now we have this nice decomposition. Remember that STL, the L come from Lois, and the Lois is taking a kind of a smooth version of this of the trend. So this is a kind of a smooth version of the trend. Now we subtract the data from the trend and we obtain the seasonal part, and then we have the reminder. As I was saying, STL and all the composition methods are good for exploratory analysis. And I think this exploratory analysis tells us a couple of things. The first thing is that the periodic part is strong. We already knew that by a simple inspection and also that we can have a strong correlation. So whenever you have this uh, kind of train of bumps going up and train of bumps going down, so here you have a cluster of hubs, a cluster of downs and so on and so forth, probably correlation is going to be high and then ARIMA methods are going to be useful there. Okay. Okay. Next stop. Let's feed exponential smoothing. This can be done at almost automatically using ETS. Why? And then let's plot this, feed ETS, and here we go. An interesting thing is that this automatic feeding method is telling us the order of the error. So this is additive error, additive dump with trend, and additive seasonal part. One thing that I love for, for this ETS is that typically the level is not captured very well because it's, op it's kind of overfitting the trend, but the slope is, is smooth very, very nicely. So you can describe the data pretty well. You can say that the overall trend is increasing but the rate at which this this trend was increasing is uh, stabilized. So you can see that the slope is going to zero. So you could say that the number of subsidies in this problem, I don't remember the details now. Yeah, the monthly cortico corticosteroid drug subsidy is uh, stabilizing over time. Okay, and this is a nice interpretation. You also have this part here, this, this shoe soft part here, telling us that seasonality is important and actually is really strong. So there are huge differences from winter to summer probably or something like that okay let's take a look at the summary of the feed and you can see the details so remember that ETS in general we have a seasonal part and the trend and the slope so these coefficients are related to the slope and they are not very informative but here I want to focus in this part so the root mean square error which is 0.02 and the maximum and absolute error which is also 0.02 so this we are going to use this later in order to compare with different methods okay now let's take a look at the residuals we, we have a couple of functions there we can use check residuals but i prefer to use gts display extracting directly the residuals so ets residuals because now we have the 
the, a, the, the ACF and the PACF, okay? And you can see a couple of interesting things. So you have a lot of bars outside the task blue lines. They are not huge, uh, but you still see that you are not capturing things very well. And actually what is more concerning to me is that you have some kind of periodicity. So this bar is at 12, this bar is at almost at 24, but also you have in the middle of the year. So you have these bars which are negative correlated with the value of today. And this is probably around 6, this is probably around 18, and so on and so forth. So you can see clearly the periodicity. You also see that in the partial or correlation function. And this is pushing me somehow to use Arima methods. So let's move to that in that direction. So now let's do some auto Arima. Fit Arima. Sorry. Minus auto Arima y. Okay, let's take a summary of this. And a couple of interesting things. First of all, you can see that this coefficient is significant because twice this value is smaller than the absolute value of this one. This also is, is relevant. This is in the border, so you can see that twice this value is larger than this one. So this coefficient is, is not going to be significant. E this is going to be and this is going to be. So probably a simpler model would be something like 210 because we're going to drop this coefficient and the seasonal part uh, 012 or something like that. But again, let's move a little bit. So let's check the residuals. So GGTS, fit Arima, resid, uh, sorry, residuals. Here we go. And this is nice. You still see some bars outside the dust blue line. But now the, the relative value is really small. So you can see that this is ranging for, let's say, minus 15 to 0.15. And this is around 0.18. So this is not that concerning. Okay. So th this m seems that. Arima is capturing pretty well the correlations, okay? Okay, let's do some forecasting and compare. I'm going to use grid, arrange, and I'm going to use autoplot. Oh, sorry, autoplot. And then I'm going to plug a forecast using the first method, fit ETS, and sorry, STL, and we're going to you extend that to 20 period 20 time series in the future and now I'm going to use another plot in this case forecast exponential smoothing again h equals 20 and the last one forecast feed arima and again h equals 20 so let's plot this and here we go you can see that all of them are comparing pretty well Actually, probably the, the most conservative one is Arima, and you can see here why. So the, the amplitude of the prediction of the inter predictive interval is increasing with time. I kind of like that, because that means that you're, you're being more conservative into the future. Here you are ex extremely confident that you're going to be hidden, but you can see that some months or some years, I would say, you have some spikes in the data, up in, the, in the highest part or in the lowest part, that probably are not captured by this confidence interval here. So probably Arima is capturing this sort of fluctuations and, and I would say that in that regard, he's the winner. Okay, let's try to be more quantitative and I'm going to use this function T time series cross validation. You can take a look at the help, but basically we need to provide a time series, a function, and then the scope of the prediction. So how many steps in the future are, going, are we going to predict? This function window is also interesting because you, you can use a kind of a sliding window. So if you remember cross-validation, we were cutting the, the data set in different parts, but with this sliding window, we're basically increasing one step at a time. So this is going to be more correlated, but when the data set is small, it's, I, it's more advantages, I would say. Okay, so let's first create some functions. I'm going to keep notation simple. So this f comes from forecast, a from arima, and then I'm going to define a function of two parameters, x and let's say y and h, and simply I'm going to use the function forecast, and now the fit, arima, and then h equals h, okay? Let's do the same for the composition, so let's change for this stl, and from exponential smoothening, ets, okay. So here we go. Now I'm going to j just run the command for a while. So ts cross validation and then y is our time series and then f.a, I'm going to define the maximum window of observation of prediction, sorry, x max equals one. And here x h equals max. Okay, 
If you run this, you see that we have a prediction into the future, but if we change this to 2, for instance, you see that we are losing some information. Why is that? Because I cannot predict beyond the, the number of, of lags that I'm going to anticipate into the future. So I'm going to use NA omit to remove all the NAs, and I'm going to store this into a function. Again, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to call the error of the residuals as error of Arima. Okay, the A comes from Arima. Okay. And now I'm going to do the same for STL and the same for and the same for ETS. Okay, so here we go. Now I'm going to do a summary. Instead of trying to compute all these things, I'm going to use a summary and I'm going to create a data frame with the errors square in order to remove uh, the cancellation of positive and negative residuals. E okay, so here we go. If we take a look at this at this graph, it means that the mean uh, square error, okay, so basically this is the mean square error, MSE, is 4.6 10 to the minus 2 in the case of ARIMA and, sorry, Yes, in the case of ARIMA, and it's going to be 2.8 in the case of STL. So in this case, the composition provides lower errors. And in this case, this is ETS, so this is exponential smoothing, also small error. And also, you take a look at this row. This is the maximum absolute error, the MAA. Okay, and you see that this is more or less the same. So this is the best one, and this is the second, and this is the third. So in this case, ARIMA is losing, but why is that? because basically I'm using a very short lag into the future. So now, if I use 20, instead of taking all the output, I'm going to take just the 20th column, because this is going to provide different predictions for different time points. 20, sorry, x max, h max, h max, and here we go. Let's calculate again the forecast. And now you see that the mean error in this case is 10 to the minus 3, in this case, uh, 9, 10 to the minus 3, so it's slightly larger. And this is more, sorry, this is the, the, the median. Well, in the end, this is the best one. <laughs> this is the second and this is the third. So why is that? Because the farther we go into the future, the non-parametric models like STL are going to provide a worse explanation because basically they are just decomposing according to the past, but they are not trying to understand how is the future built. And the same for the maximum and absolute error. So you can see that this is the smaller, then this one, and then this one. Okay. So in the end, I would say that RMI is the winner for these two reasons. First, because somehow it's more, it's trying to capture better the correlations. And if you go back to these check residuals that we've plot before, for instance, for ETS, clearly ETS is not capturing pretty well the seasonality. And, and I would say that RMI is capturing better the residuals, it has lower, uh, low, the lowest actually mean square error and the lowest maximum amplitude error. And the other thing that we have to take into account is that, give, give me, let me go back to this figure, is that being more conservative sometimes is better because you are kind of accounting for these huge fluctuations in the peaks and the valleys that you can see in the data. Okay, in the next video, I will show you how to do repeat the same analysis using another data set so you have a clear picture of what's going on here.